Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Cody. I'm an alcoholic. Cody. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, welcome to, uh, what was it, Mia and... What's your name again? Ian. Ian. Welcome, you guys. Um, I heard someone say when I first got here that really stuck with me, like, you don't have to drink or do drugs anymore if you don't want to. Um, and that's what I needed to hear when I came in. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. Uh, I grew up in a pretty normal household. I had two parents that drank. Um, I thought that it was all right to do because everyone else's parents, all my friends' parents drank. So anything, they didn't seem out of the ordinary. Um, they fought a lot and only got physical a couple times, but even still, uh, from a young age, I had to learn how to be a mediator to two adults. And, um, first I had to get my daughter, my daughter, my sister out of, uh, harm's way, uh, just in case it did get physical. Um, so eventually, like eventually that marriage uh, disintegrates and then, you know, I'm super, I wasn't happy, but I was relieved that it was finally over. I was done with all the fighting and everything. Just didn't want to be around it anymore. I think I was like 11 at that point. So, um, you know, I start going out and experimenting with stuff to make me feel better because from a young age, I never felt like I fit in. I always felt uncomfortable, um, always wanted everyone's acceptance. I remember, uh, they, uh, I was having higher scores in class and, um, they, they put me into a gate class, like, um, for higher intelligence kids. And, uh, I liked it at first cause I liked being challenged cause they thought I had ADD, uh, teachers did at a young age because I wasn't being challenged. So I was just bouncing off the walls of the classroom and, um, I liked the class cause it would challenge me, but then it was such a small class and I, like we had to be pulled out in front of the whole class. I didn't like being set aside from everyone. So I remember at it, uh, very shortly after the classes started, I purposefully like made myself seem dumber and got kicked out. So I didn't stand out from anyone. And, um, you know, looking back, I probably could have done things differently. I should have done things differently, but it is what it is. And um, so, yeah, fast forward back up to trying to make make myself feel better. Remember, I smoked weed for the first time. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> drugs are part of my story, um, as in a lot of people in the Bay Area's story. Uh, if you'd have a problem with that, go to another meeting um, and listen to someone. Story that just has about alcohol, because I'm sure you'll hear it. Um, so, yeah, I started experimenting with weed at a young age. Um, before that, I remember my first drink was at like six or seven. My dad gave it to me. I thought it would be okay because he was giving it to me. Like my dad wouldn't do anything to purposefully hurt myself or hurt me. I didn't get drunk, but I remember I liked the taste of it. And um, I felt like an adult walking around with a Coors Light can. Um, so I'm now 12, 13, getting into high school, smoking weed. And uh, I was like a responsible weed smoker. I didn't smoke like during school or anything like that. I would only do it before uh, work or after school or on the weekends. And uh, finally, last day of senior year, I like finally went to school high, and I was like, this was it. I should have been doing this the whole time. This was a great thing. And, um, yeah, I got into a, a little bit of trouble with the law, uh, so a bunch of speeding tickets and stuff like that. My mom, I started trying to sell weed, and my mom had freaked out. She's like, nope, you're moving. I'm kicking you out. At my 18th birthday party in front of all my friends, right after she beat me in a keg stand, she kicked me out. And um, I had went and lived with my dad's mom down in uh, San Luis Obispo for about five years. I liked being out of it, uh, out of the town I grew up in. It's a super small town, like less than 2,000 people. So everyone knew everyone's business. So uh, when I started getting in trouble, everyone knew about it right away. And they were people that I didn't necessarily know that well. Uh, go down to San Luis Obispo. And to me, that's a huge city. Coming from a town of less than 2,000 people, there's this like college. I was right by Cal Poly. There's this college atmosphere. And uh, it was pretty fun. And um, get this girlfriend. We, uh, we were together for about three years. Moved in with each other after about a year. Got a dog. And so like I thought... I thought the next step was going to be like, okay, well, I mean, to me, in my mind, the next step is, will you marry me? Um, I was pretty young. Like, we started fighting a lot, and I was like, maybe let me hold down on the ma- or hold off on the marriage, start fighting a lot, like I said. And uh, we both come to a mutual agreement that the relationship isn't working. Her parents are moving to Las Vegas. She's like, I think I'm just going to move with her, my parents. I'm like, you know what? That's probably a good idea. 
so we split up. I uh, I didn't think the, the relationship was going to affect me the way it did. I forgot what it was like to sleep by myself in my bed. And um, so I started doing other drugs. I had almost kicked a roommate out for doing oxys at the time. And I was like, you know what? I can't sleep. I see you guys passing out all the time everywhere. So I'm going to try that, uh, see what that's like. And I was hooked right away, uh, right there. It was like the moment I tried it, just like that, the clouds had parted. I felt, I suddenly felt um, at ease. It shut my brain off. I felt comfortable and at ease. I didn't care about anything that was going on. I could shut my eyes and just be content. And um, as with the case, as with the story with a lot of people, um, my pill addiction graduated to other drugs. And uh, within a short period of time, I was mainlining drugs. And um, it was all downhill from there. I had a buddy that was from Detroit warn me about it. He had seen it growing up in Detroit where uh, opiates are a pretty big deal. He's like, once every once you go to the needle, it's a pretty – there's no turning back. I'm like, no, man. Like, I got this. I got pretty strong willpower. And it um, didn't work. My saving grace up until that time, every, my, everyone in my family knew I had a problem with substances. My saving grace was, yeah, I may have had some speeding tickets when I was younger – but I've got I've had no real problems with uh, the law as far as my drugs are concerned. So you guys can say whatever you want to say, but I'm paying my rent. I'm not asking you guys for money. Let me live my life. And uh, the universe listened to that. And to prove a point, I got in trouble. And uh, there was my get out of jail free card, literally. And um, or they went right out the window. Started getting in trouble again and again and again and again. Tried my first geographic. Moved back up from San Luis Obispo to my hometown. And uh, switch substances from opiates to uh, uppers. And uh, I was like, this is not what I want, but it's something. And um, continued to get in more trouble, more trouble. Finally moved away, moved back, or moved here to the Bay Area. And I th- as much as I thought San Luis Obispo and the Central Coast was like a big city, the first time like I walked into San Francisco, I was like, what the fuck? This is crazy. I'm from a town that like we have one blinking four-way red light in the middle of town. And I get off the bar for the first time and like I can't even – I look up and I can't even see the tops of buildings. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> Turns out I'm claustrophobic also. Didn't know that until I got on BART during rush hour and um, had like a super anxiety attack. And yeah, it sucks. One minute. Okay, I got to get sober. Um, I caught a new case, went to rehab. And uh, while I was in rehab, I was doing it only because I wanted to stay out of jail. And while I was in there, something clicked. I don't know what it was. I've stopped trying to pinpoint it. All I know is that it worked and something stuck. I've been trying to get clean since I was 20. I'm now 30. I have a little over two years. Um, Before I got clean, I had a daughter. Also, before I got clean, I wanted to be in my daughter's life, but I knew that I really couldn't. I didn't didn't know how to. And um, while I was in rehab, that all changed. And I still wanted to be in her life, but I thought that... It would be best if I uh, do so from afar, and I'm glad that the rehab wouldn't let me leave for six months. And um, I had I got to learn how to become an adult, and I'm still in that process of learning how to become a parent, and it's an ongoing process. It's, I still get super frustrated. and um, But, you know, I wouldn't be able to do any of that stuff uh, if it wasn't for this program, the steps and the traditions, um, mainly the steps. Uh, everything that I can, I have been able to do in my life since I got clean is because of these steps and because I worked them with a sponsor and not try to work them myself. If you are new, I highly suggest working those steps. There's a reason you hear it said in meetings all the time. It's because it works. Um, but you know, find someone that you can relate with. That was the key with me. I found someone that I could relate with, that I saw myself, I saw my story and their story and someone that I trusted. When they said like, hey, do this, it'll probably work. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I trust you. It'll probably, if it worked for you, and you're a bigger dirtbag than I am, it'll probably work for me. Um, and you know, now like I, I work, I, uh, I'm a fairly responsible adult or productive member of society. I pay bills, even begru- even though I pay them begrudgingly, I still pay them on time. And uh, yeah, like I get to be in my daughter's life. My parents and family want me back around. My daughter's mom and I have a great relationship. We're actually better now as co-parents than we were in a relationship. Um, and yeah, like I get to go back to my treatment center that I went through and I get to sponsor guys from there. And that's like a super rewarding thing. That's where the magic of the program is, is sponsoring people. That's honestly why I wanted to do the steps was so I could help someone. I didn't give a shit about one through 11. I just wanted to get to 12 and help someone. And um, But it's also, it was super fearful. Um, but just like anything, if I have enough faith, then I... I'm fine. I have enough faith that my higher power is going to walk me through it, just like he did with my sobriety. And he's led the way for me so far. Um, If you're new and you need a sponsor, talk to me after the meeting. I'm available for sponsorship.
I'm Michelle, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Michelle. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope my voice doesn't go lower. Um, so, I'm really excited to speak here. Um, my sponsor took me to this meeting when uh, I was like seven days, six days, six, seven days sober. I got sober on a Saturday. Uh, Sunday, sorry. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I used to really love this meeting because I never had to share as a newcomer. I could just come and listen. Um, here I am. Uh, so I'm an alcoholic and I was, I got sober on May 3rd, 2015. So a little over three years, um, which is really intense and crazy to say because I started drinking at 18 and I didn't get sober until I was 29 and I never put more than two weeks together of actually trying to stay away from drugs and alcohol. Um, the one time I did, I was working at a, at a sports bar and it was the month of February, like it is now, because it's the shortest month of the year. We had this bet going that like, if you could stay sober for the entire month of February, then you're not an alcoholic. And that was my real attempt. Like I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay sober. And one week was easy. I just like stayed in my room and I didn't see any of my friends and then the second week, I just went out for, like, a birthday, and we were sitting down, and they ordered one glass of wine, and then, then the second one came around, and it just, it was like a light switch. I just was like, oh, well, now I want to get drunk, and I can just, like, do it again, ne like, later. I can just, like, you know, choose to not drink another time, and um, for the longest time, like, I always, like, justified that I wasn't an alcoholic because, um... I just surrounded myself with people who drank the way that I did. Um, and yeah, I just, okay, it's a long share. So I'll start in the beginning. At 18, um, my curfew got extended because I was an adult and um, my parents were incredibly strict growing up. So I never really went out past 10. So I never got to like hang out with my friends and go to parties so when I turned 18, um, living in San Diego, I was 20 minutes away from Mexico. So my friends at this time were already going to Mexico like every weekend. And so I'm super excited. I've got my ID because you only need to be 18, 16 for like most people. But anyway, so I'm excited to go. And the whole time I'm like really nervous because it's Mexico. And I'm like, I have to be so careful about like who makes my drink and like make sure I always have a buddy with me. And, um, you know, I was so excited to like order a drink. Like before I could even, before I was even drinking, I was like excited about mixed drinks and like what's in them and all the different colors and all the garnishes. Like I was so excited to have that be a part of my life. Um, and so I was like really excited to, to be out there and be drinking with my friends. And I had no, I, it didn't like, it didn't register that I should like monitor how much I drink. I just like drank cause I was so thirsty and, you know, we would say that we're just going out there to dance and have a good time. And it so quickly turned into, like, pre-drinking before we get to Mexico. And then it turned into, like, um, you know, I'm just, I've lost my friends and I don't know where I am. And I'm not sure if I'm walking towards the border or not. And, um, and I'm alone. And, like, you know, I don't want to get in a taxi because, like, I'm alone. And they might, like, not take me to where I need to go. Um, but also from that experience, I had to constantly see like a police officer and tell them that I'm a U.S. citizen. So I got really comfortable being drunk around cops because at first I thought like I have to sober up before I get to the border. And then I realized like we're all good as long as we're not like fighting or anything. They're not going to take us to the drunk tank. So I got really comfortable just like speaking to people when I was intoxicated. Um, and so that was like until I was 21. I did that every weekend. And me and my friends would like take photos and then there would be this like, I, I, I would like joke that like that was our, that was our way of knowing what happened that night because I would black out. And so I would 
like look at the photos the next day, like hoping to recap, like what happened. And then I would be so sad when the pictures ended and I'd be like, what happened? Like my face looked crazy. <laughs> I looked really fucked up. And we would always, I like me and my friends would always swear that like somebody put something in our drink. Like we got so drunk last night. Like there's no way that that was just alcohol. Um, and then I started snowboarding a lot. And when I would come back, from, it was like, I live in San Diego, we drive to LA, uh, Big Bear or whatever, and it's like, you know, four or five hours away, and we'd snowboard all day, and when we would come back, I, I guess I have like allergy problems or something, I would get this constant ear infection on the drive back, and I would have to go to the emergency room to get Vicodin for the pain, that's what I was like looking forward to, and um, it happened so often that like, I remember thinking, like, I should take the Vicodin with me when I go because I'm probably going to get another ear infection. But then my second thought was, like, or you could get more Vicodin if you just, like, keep the pain long enough and then go to the emergency room. They'll give you another bottle because they give you so many and you really just need one for the next day. Anyways, because <laughs> the pain, you take antibiotics and it goes away. But, like, I was already, like, counting how many pills I had and, like, when we could go snowboarding again. And so... Like, then it just, like, it picked up this addiction with, like, with mixing Vicodin with beer and then also going in a jacuzzi because all of that, like, it intensifies, like, the high. And so I got really interested in, like, getting, like, the most high. Um, and then some of my friends started doing drugs. And um, as long as, like, I was offered them for free the first time, I was interested in trying them. I never wanted to try a new drug if I had to pay for it first. I thought like that obviously is not a good drug. <laughs> um, so I started doing a lot of cocaine um, and it turned into like this thing where I would just like, I'd run out and I would like ask everyone around me at first, like me and my friends would be like, Oh, like, let's just look for the people who are like touching their nose a lot. And then it was like, let's just ask everyone. <laughs> and then it would turn into like, you've already asked me. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, just like, so I like drugs and I like alcohol. And then, um, yeah, I was always, like, doing it at really inappropriate times or inappropriate places. Like, um, once I started working in restaurants, um, the bartenders uh, at this one place I started working at would give us alcohol in, like, a kid's cup because it, it had cartoons or something around it. You couldn't see inside. And I remember, like, the first time and being like, we can do this? And they were like, yeah, like, just don't tell anybody if you're, like, straight and you don't act drunk you know, it's chill. And I got tired of like flirting with the bartenders in order to get alcohol in those little kids cups. So I'd bring my own and, um, and get trashed at work. And then I just started looking for other places where it was appropriate to drink at work, like the horse races in Del Mar. And I would get so trashed and it's like 45 minutes away from my house. So then we'd be like, well, we obviously need to like party somewhere now because we can't just drive home. We're like really drunk. And so, um, yeah, it just, uh, I really liked to be out and about, um, and just, I didn't care about being like shamefully drunk in front of people. Um, so it was a lot of like puking and peeing in the street and, you know, just being with people that I wouldn't normally want to hang out with, um, if I was sober because, um, yeah, people used to say like, I don't know, I like you cause you're just down, you're just down to do whatever. And it's like not a compliment, but I really like pride myself on that. I was like, yeah. Um, or like one time I like threw my hair, my hair used to be like really long and I threw my hair up in a ponytail or a bun really fast because I knew I was going to puke. And someone was like, wow, like you did that really fast. And I was like, yeah, like I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, it just got, it just, it just wasn't pretty. And, um, let's see. I, uh, eventually at the emergency room, they started like noticing that I was coming there a lot. And they told me that if this continues, like 
I'm going to have to have like surgery on my ear. And they were like, or you can just take like Claritin before you go up and then you won't have this problem. And I was like, fuck, I have to like, I can't do Vicodin anymore. And plus, I remember, like, looking on the internet, like, when have you taken too much Vicodin? And it was like, oh, your liver will start to hurt. And I was like, where's your liver? Is it, like, right here? Because this is where I get a lot of pain. And then I was like, you know, these are obviously signs that I need to, like, not do Vicodin anymore. And so, like, I would just, like, make excuses, like, to do from one drug, I would go to another. Um, And, um, yeah, so all my friends were, like, getting knocked up, getting married, and, like, having really great jobs, and I was, like, still in San Diego, and I, cut like, I don't know, I, I sort of, like, never thought I would live um, to, like, be a grown-up. I thought, like, I was going to die young, and so I never really, like, planned my life or had a life plan. Like, even in high school, they were like, where do you want to go to college? And I was like, I'm not going to live to go to college. Like, that's not going to be me. Um, and then it creeped up on me and I was like, fuck, I guess I should go to college. So, um, one of my friends was like, let's go to San Francisco. Um, they're doing like a late registration. And so I was like, fuck it. Okay. (laughs) Um, that sounds chill. And so, uh, she got pregnant and I was like, well, I got in, so I'm going. And I came out here and I thought like, you know, this is going to be different. I'm going to take school seriously and, um, you know, have a life and without, without, you know, all of the drugs, alcohol was always there. And it was like my only solution for, um, every occasion. (laughs) Like, I don't think I, um, I didn't like go to an event unless I knew that there was going to be alcohol there. And I always brought it with me. Um, And so when I came to San Francisco, um, I was just drinking for a while. And then a friend of mine, I was like really trying to surround myself with people who were like serious about school and not about partying because I feel like I did enough of that. It's time to be an adult. And then one of my friends was like, you should meet my friend, um, Allison. And I was like, really? And they were like, yeah, I think you'd really get along with her. And she loved to do, um, some drugs that I've never done before. And, uh, and so we started hanging out a lot and doing these drugs while we were doing our homework. So I thought this is still me being an adult because I'm like, (laughs) I'm like doing my homework and I'm just getting inspired. And so, um, you know, it didn't matter that like I almost failed classes um, or like came out of a blackout talking to one of my professors. Cause we were like, it was like a, it was like an exhibit and everybody was drinking. I don't know why my professor wanted to talk to me at this time, but I came out of the blackout and he's looking at me like, like as if I was coming on to him. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so weird. Like I have no idea what we're talking about or what's going on here and just feeling so awkward. And I had so many moments like that. Um, in my drinking where like I'm having a conversation and I'm trying not to show that I just came to and I have no clue what we're talking about. So I'm just trying to play it off and like trying to read everybody's like, are we sad? Are we excited? Are we happy? Um, I just so wanted like no one to tell me that my drinking was a problem. Um, and so (sighs) let's see. So I came here. And then, um, I remember again, like snowboarding brought me to mammoth for like winter break. And a friend of mine was like, if we get jobs as lift operators, we can snowboard for an entire month for free. And I was like, I'm so down, let's do that. And like, we could just like Craigslist couch surf. And, um, and so I did that and I got kicked out of every place that I lived, um, like within two weeks. And, um, the first place the guy was like a drug dealer. So when he kicked me out, I stole some of his weed before I left. Cause like, obviously I needed to take care of myself. And the, um, second place, these guys were really nice. I feel really bad. I just like drank all their alcohol and I went to a party. It was like New Year's Eve and 
I was like, my cousin came from LA to visit. And so we're like, let's get trashed. And they, um, they didn't have any chasers. So we were like trying to like drink vodka with Starburst, like as if that was a good idea. Um, it's not. And, uh, it was like so crazy. Anyway, so we get to this party and like, I remember coming out of a bathroom and this guy has like just this like, like sandwich bag Ziploc of like, molly and i have no idea like what this drug is i've never heard of it and he's like you just lick your finger and then you know like that's it like you just that's how you get high you lick your finger stick it in the bag so i was like okay my middle finger is my longest finger (laughs) (laughs) so i like licked it all the way to the knuckle and i stuck it in all the way to the bottom of the bag and i did that twice and he was like Oh shit. And that's like what I lived for. I love to see people be like, Oh damn, like that's crazy. And I just, I just like hopped past him. I was like, yeah, like no big deal. And I just remember one person said to me, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but I just remember them saying like, you're not going to remember any of this. And I was like, yes, I am. (laughs) And I don't remember anything. Like, there's pictures and I look like the devil. Like my eyes are so black and I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) and the person who I was living with at the time was like, you got to go. Like you, we got kicked out of every party that we went to. And, um, I vaguely remember someone yelling at me and being like, like, you're fucked up. Like you're on drugs. Like you got to get out of here. And so I, the, when I came to, like, I came out of a, the blackout, I guess. Um, I was like walking in the middle of the woods with my cousin. We had no idea where we were going and we could hear people counting down and we were like, Oh shit, we should hitchhike like, back into town if we see a car. And somebody came and they picked us up. They were really nice. And I puked in their car and I felt so bad. Cause like <laughs> it could have gone so much worse. And I was like, of course I do like this thing to people who are being kind to us. We just, I, I have no idea how I got home or what happened, but, uh, then I went to go live with someone else. Like it just like, wasn't a big deal. I remember going into work the next day though. And like, you know that, like when you walk into a room and everybody just sort of like gets quiet and they're just like, that's the girl. Like, I knew that that was me and I was like, whatever, this is going to be like two days of this and we'll be over it. I was like, I'm just going to keep my head down. And like, I was just so okay with like shame and just like embarrassment that I was just like, I don't fucking know these people. Like I'm never going to see them again. And I was okay with it, which is really sad. Um, and I just like justified my actions, I guess. And so, um, I went to go live with this other guy who was like super into special K and he, he like obviously was okay with my bullshit. Um, he never kicked me out. (laughs) Um, cause I told him I like knew somebody who had it, but I, we never got it for him. But anyway, so, um, that was my time living there and I came back and I got like, um, an event coordinating job. And this was like my chance to be a grown up and like have a real job. And I remember going out with a couple of my employees and some clients and they were like, Oh fuck. Okay. Um, they were just like, you can't drink like that in front of us. And I was like, Oh, this job's not for me. And so, um, I, I ended up going back to school to be a preschool teacher. And, um, the first day that I, that I got the job or when I got the job, the first thing that they had like an AA, they had a AA, they had an A's game party. And so of course I pre-drank before I got there, got blacked out drunk, came to, and I'm speaking to the owner and I'm in tears and I have no idea why I'm crying. And I'm like, this is such a shitty start to like a job. And every time she saw me after that, she'd always look at me kind of weird. And I like, I would just be like, whatever, this is normal. Like, and I worked there for three years. It was so awkward. Like, I have no idea what I said to her, what we were talking about. Um, anyway, so my drinking was just like a hot mess. And, um, towards the end, cause I have 20 minutes now, I really want to get sober. Um, I, I was, I have an apartment and I was, well, I kicked out the master tenant basically. And, um, I like, uh, convinced her to pass it down to me. And so 
I started like living with people who drank harder than I did. Like, I don't know how these people find me. And I was like, I need to get a roommate who's like sober because then that'll get me like straight edge. And, um, so I put out this ad and I got somebody who was sober and it turns out that they happened to be in AA and, um, we like casually dated, I guess. <laughs> and, um, it was a hot mess and, uh, but like, regardless, it was an introduction and like we, we'd go to parties and I'd see that he wasn't drinking. And I was like, wow, like if somebody who's young and like pretty hot can just like hang out and like, cause I thought like it was going to be just like super boring. And it was like in San Diego, it was like for people who had like three DUIs and went to jail. And I was like, I haven't done those things. So I'm not an alcoholic. And, um, you know, so it just, it, I don't know, I guess it was like <laughs> attraction, not promotion. I just like saw that he could do this, like he could like live in the world and and not drink. And um, yeah, so I like started going to Al-Anon and I noticed that my life got better. I wanted to I wanted to drink less. Um, it just meant I, I hit it more. And um, so uh, that relationship didn't work out. Um, and when he left. Um, it was like, there was just like so much chaos going on in my life. And I don't want to talk about it right now because I only have a few minutes. So regardless, like I was emotionally like, and like, uh, just spiritually completely bankrupt. And I was like crying in my apartment and I was just like, so incredibly sad. Like, what am I going to do now? Cause I was like crazy codependent. Um, and I don't like to be alone. Like I like to be in a room full of people and like not tell anybody what's really going on. And so I was terrified cause I was like really alone and I like didn't want to hang out with any of my friends anymore cause they drank really crazy. And so, uh, <laughs> I like called up a friend cause I didn't want to be alone. It was like better than being alone. And, uh, they were drinking and I, swore to myself like I'm not gonna drink tonight um I hear people say that all the time like I tried not drinking and I'm like I didn't really try, try that uh and so I um I didn't want to drink and then I I saw I like came to and I had a, I had a beer in my hand and I wasn't sure how many I had or when I started and I was like that's so weird uh and I immediately left the next day I woke up with like intense anxiety and I like showed up at an AA meeting and I raised my hand and I said I was an alcoholic I was like covered in tears and everybody gave me hugs and I thought that was really weird and then they told me to keep coming back and I was like okay and they're like there's another meeting right after this this is a 740 meditation meeting at Rockridge and so I went to the 9 a.m. And then after the 9 a.m., I went to the noon. And then after the noon, I went to, I went to, after the 9 a.m., I went to a 10.30. Then I went to the noon. Then I went to, like, a 10.15. Sorry, 10.15. Uh, I went to a 5.15. Then I went to an 8 o'clock uh, Young People's in Alameda. And this was six meetings in my first day because I was like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. But if I drink, like something bad's going to happen and I'm really scared. And everybody was really welcoming. They gave me a number of books and I was so grateful that um, I was desperate enough to ask for help and to do whatever was suggested. And so the first suggestion was to like call the women who gave me their numbers and just say thank you. And I did that and um, everybody was really nice and receptive. And I was like, okay, this feels good. And then... You know, I kept going to meetings and they'd look at my book and they'd be like, go to this meeting, go to this meeting. And even though I had a job and I, I thought I had a life, like I was like, I work out and I go to the, I go to the gym and like, I, I have work, like, how am I going to fit in meetings? And, um, so back to the first day I met my sponsor the first day. She was like, I'm going to be your sponsor. And I was like, well, I don't know. I've heard that like, I should like find somebody who wants what I have. And she looked at me and she was like, do you want to get sober? Like, like she was just like, do you, you know, I, I'll, I'll be your temporary sponsor until you find one then I guess. And I was like, okay. And I was like, can we do the fourth step now? And she was like, no, we have to start at the beginning and we have to read the big book. And I was like, well, I really want to do the fourth step. And she's like, well, I can meet with you twice a week and we'll get to the fourth step as soon as you work one through three. And so, um, we did. And, uh, 
<sighs> it was, um, and it has been, like, so rewarding. <coughs> um, and I'm really grateful that, um, that I met her the first day. And because I, I called her every day for the first two weeks, like she asked. And I always reached out to newcomers um, because she told me, even though I'm still new, like, I have something to give and I can show up for other people. And that really helped me out a lot when I got to the third step and I had no concept of what a higher power was or how that was going to help me and how to define that. And um, somehow doing the next right thing and helping somebody else got me out of my own way and things would just naturally happen the way that they were supposed to. And it sort of clicked for me that like, oh, like I'm not in control. And as long as I don't make my higher power me or somebody else, like everything's going to work out. And in sobriety, I've been fired. I've had to go to court. I've dated somebody who's relapsed and that's so fucking painful. And, you know, my, it's like, I've gone to a wedding sober when I was only four months sober. That was really scary. Um, uh, it was my sister nonetheless. So I was like really looking forward to getting drunk at that point party and I was really grateful that I got to be sober and be of service like that was a new concept for me I was so wrapped up in self and like what I can get from you and what you can give me that I had no idea that I could do stuff for other people like like to just ask do you need help or to like see what they're doing and then just help them and it was like when I was new and, and scared about like oh if I pick up this cup does it have alcohol in it or like is everyone gonna look at me weird because I'm not drinking like those thoughts were always there, but I, I could still like be useful and keep my hands busy mm -hmm. by like just being helpful. And people would look at me and just be like, wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just, um, it's just so crazy that like my whole life, I, I, that, that was not a part of, of, of me. And now it's like, I have this huge, big Italian family and I've only talked to like some of us. And now I get to talk to everybody because like, there's there like, I would only hang out with people who like, like to do the same stuff I did. And so, um, it just, it was crazy to me. I was like, I know nothing about you and we're related. Like, let's have a conversation. And it's just like, how sad, how sad that like my world was so limiting when I thought like, I thought people who didn't drink were like so bizarre and like, how do you, how do you cope with life? And it's like, you know, this like concept of a higher power it is something that I have to like constantly be in contact with and the way that um that I do that is by doing 10-step inventories and meditating and um being of service and I definitely like this week and the last two weeks I have not been reaching out to the newcomer as much as I could have been I don't run a perfect program I don't write 10 steps every day but when I get angry, I definitely do. <laughs> um, but I know that when I do stay like on top of 10, 11 and 12, like taking inventory, um, I'm able to like see the, the patterns of like what, what is going on for me and like how I can, um, you know, just like notice those character defects, but, um, and like prayer and meditation have been, um, yeah, sorry. So just what I wanted to say about 10 was just like before, like I used to journal and I would just like write about all the things that I was like pissed about and it never really felt like satisfying or like it just felt like really shitty. And like when I write a 10 step, there's like clarity that I get around it. It's like I get to like see my part in the situation, which was like such a new concept for me because um, I never thought that like I had a part in anything. Like I thought people wronged me and like they were at fault and like everybody should pity me. And like, now I'm like, oh, like, this is where I can be, this is where I can make amends, or this is where I can be useful in the situation. And like, um, the other thing I want to say about like, sponsorship, um, is like, I've, I've heard you should find somebody who has what you want. And my, my first sponsor, I'm so grateful for, for her because she was so kind and so loving and so gentle. And I really needed that for the first like year and a half. And, um, my second sponsor was really, really, really sweet. But I also felt like I needed somebody who was going to like call me out on my bullshit. 
And the biggest like thing I got from her is she, she taught me like when I'm really scared because I had to like go to court when I had her as my sponsor and I was like terrified. And she was like, it's not about like being right. It's just like showing up as the woman that you respect and like act as if you were that person. And I like I've carried that with me into like more difficult situations when it comes to like a job interview or um, I don't know, speaking at a meeting. <laughs> and so my my third sponsor now, though, what, what I've looked for this time around um, was that I, I really wanted somebody for the way that they worked their program and the way that they had a relationship with their higher power. And so like this time around, I feel like I am really trying to get uh, to stay more in conscious contact with that because it does make life like so much less painful or less stressful when I'm able to just like stay in faith rather than fear and um, know that no matter what happens, if I lose everything, like I'm going to be okay, no matter what, I don't need to like force my will into like believing that like my solution is the only solution that's going to save me. Like I am going to be taken care of. And, um, um, yeah, meetings. I recently stopped going to meetings as much because my life is getting so full. And then I heard somebody, that's not an excuse, but, uh, I stopped going to meetings like as much. I started going to like three a week because I kept hearing that like, if you go to three a week, you're okay. Like, and so I was like, okay, minimum, I'm going to do that. And, um, I heard this guy who had like 15 years, he was like, I have, he just said it so casually. I have to go to five meetings a week. And I was like, oh, I do too. Like, <laughs> I really miss that. And so I like really upped my game and I was like going to meetings again. And I was like, yeah, like the negative self-talk has really like subsided. But I, like, wasn't – I haven't been reaching out to the newcomer as much. And so it's, like, I'm, like, ah, oh, that's the missing piece. It's, like, just be, just asking someone how their day is going, getting their phone number. And it's, like, that is, like, our primary purpose here in this program. And um, I'm just super grateful that I have a sponsor and that I stay accountable and that I can, like, share with her, like, how my day is going. And then she's, like, how's AA going? <laughs> and, um, and she could remind me about that because, um, you know – I, yeah, there's always like, there's always like more to do. And I, I don't get as hard as on myself, like about like, I'm not writing 10 steps every day. It's like, I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, let's like, let's write one right now, which I did right before this meeting. And, um, and it just, I don't know, it just feels better. Cause, um, yeah, that's like, that's like how I cope now. And I can't wait to do the traditions. <laughs> that's like my hope. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Okay. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So, if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, Visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.